All right, everyone, it's Arlington Matrix back with yet another C++ tutorial. Today we're going to be taking a look at conditional statements. Uh, we have a little base program here. It's nothing really too interesting. It just basically captures a uh, string from the command line, uh, from the command line input and uh, prints it back out. So we just compile this here really quick and uh, we'll just run it with uh, some input and it prints out 27. Now, why would we want conditionals? This program appears to work exactly as we want it to. Well, maybe we want to do something with that value. Maybe we want to uh, maybe we want to handle a case where maybe we give it nothing. Uh, in this case, it just throws an exception and aborts, but we could potentially handle that case and do something else. So uh, this episode is going to be all about conditional statements, and we're going to be using this uh, simple program as our base point. Now, first of all, let's take a look at that exception that it throws. So when we attempt to run this program without any input, it throws a standard exception. So there's uh, two things that we need to do. Um, what we're going to do first, we're going to modify this uh, parse command here in order to uh, better handle these, uh, these extraneous cases. So let's take a look at that. First is going to be if we have uh, if we have an argument count that is equal to one. All right, so this is a basic if structure, and basically the way that an if structure works is if this argument evaluates to true. So you're doing some kind of comparison, or you're passing a number, or you're passing a pointer. If it evaluates to true, which is basically anything that is not zero, then it'll execute whatever is between these brackets. Uh, we also have else if, which basically, if this is not the case, then it'll check the next thing, which in this case, it'll check if our argument count is greater than two. If that evaluates to true, then it'll do this, whatever's in between these brackets. And if nothing else happens, then it'll do what's between these brackets. Uh, for an if else structure, you do not need to have all of the if, else, if, and else. You can have an, an, an if statement that just stands alone without these other two, and uh, that is perfectly valid. But uh, we're gonna, uh, gonna take a look at uh, this if structure, and basically what we're gonna do is we're just going to, uh, we're gonna throw an exception if we don't have enough arguments or if we have too many arguments, and uh, otherwise we're just gonna actually do nothing. So we'll get rid of that other else statement or we might uh, put something in there, whoopsie. So in this case, we're going to just throw an out of range exception saying there's not enough arguments. So we've used a couple of keywords in this, uh, in this if structure. And the keywords that we're using is throw, which basically means that if, there, if this condition evaluates to true, then it is going to simply stop execution of this function and it is going to throw an exception, which we can catch within a try catch structure, which we will discuss later. Another way that you could do this is you could use a return, which some people will do. Uh, so if there's this first one, you might have a return value. I'll just comment that out because it doesn't make sense to put it there anyway. But if you were to return instead of throw, uh, there can be some issues with that, especially if you don't check the return value, uh, then it might be completely, uh, completely invalid and uh, you might end up using that value later on and so basically a throw into a try catch kind of ensures that you're handling your exception if you're using a return code how do you know that's going to be handled correctly you don't know so always throw an exception if you have to throw an exception don't use return codes because they're just fundamentally unreliable really uh, so yeah we have this uh, next up in the structure we're creating a string based on argument value one. This value will no longer throw an exception because we are ensuring that our argument count is greater than one. So we're ensuring that we have some argument to pass to it and we're also ensuring that we don't have too many arguments being passed from the command line. Next, we're defining an integer, that's fine. We, then, uh, we are then doing a string to integer conversion, which is again, that's a function which might throw an exception. So let's make sure that we handle that exception, otherwise the program will simply crash as we had before right there. Uh, the only difference being that it would be the string to integer command that's crashing the function. So instead of just running the, uh, running the assignment, we're gonna try. 
So what this does is it attempts to run that value assignment. If the value assignment fails, then the function itself will not fail and it won't just crash the program. We can, uh, we can tell it to handle the exception in various ways. So let's catch one of the exceptions that string to int will send. String to int might send an invalid argument exception. So if we pass an integer, or if we pass an input that is not an integer, then this will now throw an exception. So if we run a dot out, I don't know, abc, and it says this is not an integer. Uh, so the program will terminate once it sees, hey, this isn't an integer, it'll abort the program basically. Uh, so that's basically what your exception will do. This time we've handled it correctly instead of just throwing it to the wind. Uh, we've actually done something with it. Now, once we go up to the main part of the program, we can then catch that exception and uh, based on this exception, execute something else. Let's, uh, let's have another type of exception that we can throw. Um, uh, string to integer might also throw an out of range exception if we send it too big of a variable, too big of an integer that it can't possibly represent, then it'll throw an out of range. All right. Um, more or less completes our, uh, our integer parser. So the try catch structure is almost like an if else structure, but do not use it as such. The try catch structure is for handling exceptions. So basically it's a way of indicating that there's an error that needs to be handled in some way. Uh, we would only use this if we know how to handle the error. I'm not going to go too far with this demo, but basically this is how it works. Uh, there's an error that needs to be handled somehow, otherwise we're going to kill the program. And uh, so we handle that error accordingly. So basically the if, else if, and else structure, that's your, that's your conditional statement. Try catch is something of a conditional statement, but don't use it, as, uh, don't use it in place of an if, else, or a case statement. So let's go back up to our main program up here and uh, we'll implement, uh, implement some of this exception handling. All right, so now when there's an exception, instead of just throwing it to the wind, we're going to actually do something with that exception. We're going to tell the user what's going on and then we're going to throw it to the wind or we're going to kill the program. So if I was to compile this and then send it some garbage, It tells us that an exception was caught, that it is a non-integer type, and then it ends the program. It doesn't try to continue with this statement. Uh, so yeah, again, that's catching an exception that we know that we need to catch. We could just throw it to the wind and try running the program the rest of the way anyway, but it's not likely to uh, work out in our favor. Um, in this case, that would result in an uninitialized integer, which would just be undefined behavior when we try to print it. Next, uh, we're just going to throw this into a case switch. That's another type of flow controller, another type of conditional statement. The switch statement is a very strange formatting, which ends up being uh, the formatting of the switch statement ends up falling from uh, from way back in the day when you had C, you had Fortran, you had all those very low level languages. And it's stuck in C++ because of backwards compatibility. The case switch statement is actually extremely fast, um, just that it needs to be implemented carefully. So let's say, for example, the value we pass is 1. What we're going to do is we're just going to say execute it and break the switch. So the way that a switch statement works is it will go into the switch statement. If you have a case 1, it's going to run these sequentially right so case one evaluates to true it's going to run this and it's going to run everything else after that until it hits the break and once you hit the break that's when it pops it out of the switch so say for example say for example we have this structure there is no break between two and three let's go to the command line and we'll see how that uh how that works when we pass it a value of one as we can see, we've passed it a value of 1. It executes and it breaks the switch, and then it executes printing the value. What if we pass it a 2? We passed it a value of 2, and then it executed the case for value is equal to 2. 
but it also executed the case for value is equal to three. The reason it did that is because we did not have a break statement after this case two. So it executes case two because case two is true. Then it executes case three because it hasn't broken the switch. It'll just continue from that point within the switch structure. Uh, let's try put in a default. So the default behavior, it uh, prints a little line there and then it exits the switch. So let's compile this and pass it some unknown value. It executed the default case, it exited the switch, and then it printed the value, exactly as we would expect it to. So without the break, these are both going to exercise themselves once we pass a value of 2. We pass a value of 3, it's just going to execute case 3, and uh, then it'll execute the default case because there's no break between the two. Again, the switch case is extremely fast. Uh, this is one of the fastest comparisons you can do. However, it is just a little bit, uh, a little bit strange, uh, in the sense that its formatting is not quite like anything else you're going to see in C++. Now, one other conditional I want to show you. So, what we're going to do is we're just going to print value. Value is equal to five. So now we have a conditional statement of value is equal to five, question mark. What this question mark is doing is it's saying, if this evaluates to true, then do this. But if it is not true, then do the thing after the colon. Which is a very interesting, uh, it's an interesting form of an if structure. It's kind of differently formatted, but it allows for a lot of one-line cases where you really only need to do one thing or another based on the value of a function. So instead of doing if value is equal to five, then do one thing, else do another thing. This is basically a shortened version of the if-else structure when you only need to run a single command in either case. So again, let's compile that. And if we have a value equal to five, then it's five. If we have a value equal to six, then it's not five. So that's just a very quick introduction to conditional statements in C++. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments section down below. But other than that, have a great day. I'm Arlington Matrix, and feel free to stop by next time.